Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. Man, what is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel Lynn <laughs> All right, uh, so we just had- Van's, ex- <laughs> Van's fired up and I'm, I'm exhausted. <laughs> so we just did an interview with Larry Elder. Um, presidential candidate. He is hoping to get into the second GOP like, uh, debate. He did not make the first debate. He says it's because the GOP is hating on him. Um, but they've hated on him because he's so, he calls out Biden for the things he says. That's his reason for saying that they hate on him. Just just in case that didn't make, wasn't clear to anybody. They so, hate him because he attacks Biden as if all Republicans don't do that. So guys, I like this interview because Rachel lost her temper. (laughs) (laughs) Rachel lost her temper. Listen, this is the type of interview that the higher learning audience, the thought warriors love. Do they though? Sometimes they don't like it when they get super contentious. I think they do. We have been promising for a long time that we were going to bring a conservative voice on the podcast. Not only is it a conservative voice, it's a, well, I was going to say a black conservative, but it's not. It's a, it's a um, conservative who is black American because that's how he, that's black. how he likes to be referred to, but also a presidential candidate, which is a first. So you can imagine there was a lot to disagree on. It was a little bit of a contentious um, interview, mm-hmm. a little bit of a debate. Yeah. And, um. Tempers were takeaways. <laughs> well, well, let's not get to the takeaways until after the interview. Yeah. Let's not get to take. I do. Uh, I, take away after that is the bulk of higher learning today is going yeah. to be our interview with Larry Elder. Um, look, you guys, I think that there is some robust and appropriate discussion amongst our audience about how valuable it is to talk to people that are so diametrically opposed to you intellectually. Mm -hmm. And I want to let everybody know that's out there in higher learning land that I hear you. Uh, We hear you. We hear that sometimes these things feel like theater. They feel like they are stunts for clicks or that, you know, two people going at it is what people want to see. And it doesn't feel nourishing to the audience. I, 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 Heard that, and I get that. And not everybody is worth platforming. I think here, um, and with a lot of the other people that are running for president from the GOP ticket, I think it is worth talking to them if they've been able to garner any type of public support, which, quite frankly, Larry Elder has not been able to. uh, Because I don't think that these attitudes exist on the fringes anymore. I think there was a time when there was a lunatic fringe of the right that uh, you could ignore um, and not engage. I don't think that's uh, as true as it used to be. I think the lunatics have kind of taken over the asylum. They have. To a large degree. They're running amok. So it's now more difficult to find someone who isn't a kook than it is to find someone who is. And that's not even me saying that our guest that we have coming up is a kook. I'm just saying there are some kooky ideas in there. And when you hear those ideas, I think it's worth talking to them because you can't run from them. And I will say specifically in regards to Larry Elder, this isn't, you know, this isn't an opportunity to necessarily platform somebody. The things that Larry Elder talks about specifically harm black people. And I think that it's important to talk about the issues that he's campaigning on. He uses those issues to really put down the black community, in my opinion. And so I think it's nice to have a conversation to flush them out. Mm -hmm. And that is why, one of the reasons why he's a guest on the show today. Right. Okay, so real quick, before we get into Larry, a couple of things I do want to talk about. I want to say congratulations to all my friends in the Writers Guild that have reached a tentative agreement Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. end the strike. Pencils can pick them back up. It looks like, oh boy, time to get things rolling rolling again. And I don't want everybody to forget about the actors. We'll have a deeper dive into um, 
the ending of the writer's strike and hopefully the end of the ending of the actor's strike. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a deeper dive on the ending of the writer's strike on Thursday. I don't right. know if the actors are going to come to a deal before then. It oh, no, like not they even. Will. They're not even, even close, close even right close. now. But hopefully we have more details about what they were able to come to an agreement on. Because right now we don't. And that is, I think, the most curious thing. I want to know what got these two sides that were so far apart, not just on deal points, but on philosophy of the changing dynamic of the business on what had to happen to keep the business going. I mean, this seemed, this seemed like it was unresolvable. I actually think that it's, it's going to be harder for the actors. Interesting. Just because of the residuals, mm -hmm. even more than the AI, because it's it requires well, writers get residuals too, right? But this is like more like it requires. I don't know if the I don't know what the pay is for writers versus actors in regards to that, but there seems to be this standstill of wanting to release data from these streaming services that is going to be necessary to determine payment for actors, mm -hmm. and I think that is the the sticking point right now that is going to be really hard for them to overcome. Yeah. Um, shout out to my boy, Scott Lonker. Who's that? It's my friend. Oh, shout out to Scott. Me and Scott were in New York. And Scott's a real great guy. Me and Scott were in New York. And we were at this bar. And this lady recognized me from something. And she started trying to have like a right versus left Trump discussion. Why? And she just picked you or were you already? No, she knew me from. Okay. Yeah. And so and Long just let her have it. <laughs> Shout out to my boy. Shout now. out to Scott. Um, um, I would also like to say, I got had a couple. I had posted a picture of alcohol on my page because my shout out to Mary Louise, my seventy nine year old favorite cousin, came to see me, and she likes to throw down. But I did not participate. Okay. I had met people messaging me, Rachel, what happened to the thirty days? I am here to say I still have not had any alcohol. This is why you got so angry. <laughs> yeah. You need to drink. <laughs> Oh, in other news, the Cowboys fucking lost. Doesn't mean a thing. I ex I didn't say the Cowboys were going to be undefeated. I didn't say they were going to have lost a pet. It's fine. The Cardinals have our number. Mm -hmm. They really do. And we needed to get that out of our system. I don't want us to get too cocky. Let's go ahead. We'll lose, lose the Sunday game. Again. I'd rather it be an early game. You know, you tried to rile me up. You tried to shoot a message about that. That's okay. I told you. Longhorns won. Longhorns won. They look good, bro. I'm not going to lie. Thank you. But I, 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 like, I'm a Thank troll, you. but I'm not a hater. They look good. <laughs> like, I mean, they look good. I mean, like it. It, it was, started it was out Baylor. slow. The game started out slow. It was Baylor, but the important thing about Texas is they don't look soft. They can win a game with Quinn Euro's arm, but also in the trenches along the offensive, offensive and defensive lines, Texas be hitting people in the mouth. Yes, unlike M A M O U F mouth. Okay. Unlike the Cowboys, which. <sighs> That Dan Quinn defense did not look good. Dion went down. You see that? Dion went down. Call pause. Colorado. Okay, I was like, <laughs> Dion, who on the Cowboys? Forty two six. Um, yeah, yeah. It's but one game, as you said, good old fashioned butt, butt whooping. Kicking. Yeah. Speaking of football, I want to. Oh, real quick, I will say this about the Dion thing, you guys. Deion Sanders understands what he has to do at Colorado. Yeah. He gets the job. They've been really successful up to this point. It's going to take a little while longer for him to have a team that can go into Autzen Stadium in Eugene, Oregon, one of the most difficult places to play in all college football, and win a game. He gets it. Yeah. You don't have to get mad for Deion. All right. Nothing that this was said was was whack or out of bounds or nothing. Coaches use all kinds of things to get their players riled up. They were mad at Dan Lanning. It wasn't. It mad. wasn't that serious. It wasn't serious at all. This is college football. It happens, guys. Dion's team is playing great for the amount of talent that they have. It'll be fine. People were acting like it was the night that Trump was elected. I haven't seen yeah. that type of experience emotionally from black people in the Twitter sphere for a long time, and I don't get it. You know when I see it, it's bad. It's bad. Because I don't see, I don't normally see the kind, this kind of stuff. Also, for everybody that's saying all of these coaches are taking shots at Dion now, I just want people to know that it was be contentious between Dion and the coaches, even in the SWAT. Mm -hmm, you guys, mm -hmm. just remember, there are people that are threatened by Dion because 
College football itself isn't like podcasting. I'll tell you what I mean. Like, you don't really have to choose between your your uh, your favorite podcast. You can listen to us on Monday, The Read on Tuesday, which is a fantastic podcast. You like The Read? Oh, my God. It's good. Two of the most talented people in this entire industry and always have been. Never have a bad episode. Fantastic podcast. You can listen to stuff you you don't know. And you can listen to all of these podcasts, whatever you want. It's the same. The college football is not like that, right? It's like there are only so many five-star athletes in the country. So if an athlete goes to Notre Dame, he's not going to LSU unless he transfers later. If an athlete goes to Colorado, he's not going to Oregon. If an athlete goes to Florida State, he that's one that Syracuse doesn't get. Syracuse, I know I brought them up, but they are undefeated. Um, <laughs> so that means that everything that these guys do is competition. Everything. You can't compete with Dion in the media right now because he's too beloved. The only way you can actually take a chunk out of Colorado's ass right now is on the field. Yeah. That's the only way. You can't win a media game. You can't win a PR game. You can't win any of that. So if I'm a coach and I want players to come to my school and I want players to think that what they're doing in Boulder is bullshit, I'm going to go there and try to hang 70 on them. I'm going to try to beat them as bad as I possibly can. I'm going to try to cut the head off of this before it gets rolling. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's going to make a difference anyway. It, the, the guy's just too good at what he does and he's got too much cachet. But the fact that they went in there and scored all of those points and did what they were, that's a part of it, man. Yeah. That's like a part of it. Yeah. Speaking of football, before we move on to Larry Elder, I do want to say anything, say, say something right now. Travis Kelsey is dating Taylor Swift. She came I can't game. talk about that. We cannot talk about that. I, I am sick of it already. I am it's sick of it everywhere. Too. I'll be honest with you guys. <laughs> everywhere. I think Travis Kelsey fooled all y'all. Okay. Say your piece. I, I think Travis Kelsey fooled everyone. Travis was Kayla for a long time. Okay. And I'm going to be real with you. Travis Kelsey is a fantastic football player. A fantastic football player. But in terms of his cultural IQ, what people knew about Travis Kelsey, the relationship that he had with Kayla. What was what what happened? Did a lot for Travis Kelsey. Oh, for the culture. Cool. Yeah. For Travis Kelsey's swag, for Travis Kelsey's everything. The, his relationship yeah. with Kayla I, was a big deal. He had a beautiful black woman. That, that's my little homie. But you know, she's built like a black woman and yeah, not, not to say that black women are built one way out. I'm not trying to say anything. She's, she has, you know, it's a, it was a whole thing. Yeah, oh my I God. Mean, and Travis Kelsey's this and people paid attention to him in a different way and all of that different yes, stuff. Black women for sure. Cause they saw that he had a beautiful black woman on his arm. Black women who are by far the most loyal fan base yeah, to no, anyone no, no, you're in right. anything ever. You're right. You're right. Okay. So with her for a while, man, they broke up. This nigga cut his beard off and started fucking with Taylor Swift. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm just being for real. I look at this and I'm kind of, I don't know why, and I don't even beat people business like this. I don't know why I'm, I'm kind of salty. I'm shocked we're talking about it. I'm, I'm kind of salty. I'm, and I'm, and, and like, you know what I'm also shocked? What? That you believe it. Believe what? You coming from TMZ who just, you see Travis all Kelsey and, and Taylor Swift are going to get engaged. Okay. Travis Kelsey fact, and Taylor Swift will the, get engaged. The fact that you believe this. You are you crazy? We can we can talk about it. I don't believe it at all. I actually <laughs> for the I lie. think I think it's a publicity stunt. Because one thing Who needs it? I think one thing Travis is great at, Travis Kelsey, is garnering attention. Nah. He's really good at getting attention. He knows what to do. He knows what the camera is. He's had a show. You know, he does his dances. He's got, like, he knows what he's doing. He's got the 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 style as well. 
him, this whole Taylor Swift thing, I think it's just a big publicity stunt. I don't believe it at all. And and look at we're talking about it. We would never talk about something like this. It was we're talking everywhere. about it right now because every other thing I saw on social media Travis Kelsey had to do with them. Pulled everybody's talking about Justin it. Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus. It was a genius PR move. Used look, you even made black, Fan a believer. Black woman to get all cool, cut his beard off, went Taylor Swift. Shout out to Taylor Swift and everybody. Taylor Swift, nice lady. I like Taylor Swift. I like her songs. You know Kayla's not the first black woman he's been with. Don't matter. I'm, I'm more so saying it because it's like... Don't matter. I like I like Taylor Swift. I, legitimately, I like Taylor Swift. Like, yeah. I do. She's got great songs. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I like the music so much. I shouldn't. But like... Her songs are good. I'm not, I mean, I'm not, we're not Swifties here, but you can't deny talent. You know what? I like Taylor Swift and I like Harry Styles too. I like... Remember I said it. They got, yes. Yeah, so, I understood the yeah, album. Some, I told you. It's some, a great album. They got some. They, it's some, a good they, album. A, kind album of a deal. Of the year. <laughs> style. I love style. What a great song. You're, do you like style? Do I like style? You got your yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, 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 that thing that I like. We never go out of style. I like that shit. Okay. But look, I think they're going to get engaged. Okay. I just don't like and that I, shit. And I think it's a genius PR move. I, don't, I just don't like that shit, man. Okay, like well, they that. won't get engaged. You don't. You won't have to like They'll it get for engaged. long. Okay, it's engaged. They're at the time in their lives. Well, oh, this is this is the most important move that Travis Kelsey. This is the biggest moment of Travis Kelsey's career. Which is why I said it. It's the biggest it moment of Travis Kelsey's career. He's about to go. Psh. And for Taylor, and Taylor Swift, knew exactly what she was doing too. And for Taylor Swift, she's dated. A Remember lot the piece of, of shit she was dating athletes. before. Matt this is this is this is much. This is much better. <laughs> One of my favorite bands. <laughs> well, problematic. All right. Speaking of problematic, <coughs> introduce your friend. You called him that in the interview. I did not say he was my friend. You said my friend, Donnie. Did he not? I can't remember. Oof! I got to run it back. You Oof. definitely did. Oof. And when Oof. you find it, play it right here. I'm asking you, my friend. My friend. Yeah. Yeah. Higher learning and Larry Elder, presidential candidate, on the other side of this break. Okay. We have our first presidential candidate on higher learning. If that is still the status of who Larry Elder is, we'll talk of, of what Larry Elder is doing. We'll talk about that in a second. Larry Elder is joining us on higher learning today. Larry, how are you, my man? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. Now, look, I expect that we're going to disagree on some things in this interview. So I wanted to start off with something I feel like the three of us can agree uh, on, okay? Is that all three of us have a special love for black people, for black Americans. And so I just want you to talk about that for a second. Why do you love black people? Well, I love people uh, and I want people to be able to realize their God-given potential. And I think uh, in the case of black people, uh, a lot of black people are misled by so-called black leadership. Uh, I think we need to raise our game. I think a lot of black people mistakenly believe that uh, we're being held back because of systemic racism. Uh, when in fact, what's holding us back uh, are things like uh, uh, lack of fathers in the home, uh, poor urban schools because we don't have school choice. Uh, the lie that America remains systemically racist is also calling, causing the cops to pull back. And as a result, we have more crime than we otherwise would have. So my, my goal is always to tell people that we're free, uh, that people fought and died in order for us to be at this level where we are free. Uh, and we should take advantage of, of, our, of the freedoms that America has given us. And I think black people uh, need to do that. And that's one of the things that uh, I feel very strongly about. My father- so does that answer why you love black people? Yeah, I just wanna, I, I wanna make sure because I think sometimes- I just said yeah, I, I love people, Jim. But no, no, but I, I know love people, but I like, I'm, you're a black man. You talk a lot about your father and the experience that your father had um, coming from Athens, Georgia, the things that he did to make it in America and some of the, the obstacles that he overcame. And his story, while an American story, is also a specifically black American story. And so right. I'm just wondering, because I've also heard you say that you don't like being called the black face of white supremacy or what other people have called you. I've heard you say that. So I'm, right now, you do have a special love in your heart, a special cultural connection to black people. Do you or do you not? Well, I am a black person. I was raised in South Central Los Angeles, 
My father was raised in the Jim Crow South. Uh, so obviously there's a special connection, a special experience, a special history. Uh, but in general, I love people. I'm a God-fearing person. Uh, and I want every single person to realize his or her God-given potential. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Um, Van kind of alluded to this when he was giving your introduction. Why? So I'll just say this in a general sense before we get into it and where you are in, in regards to um, whether or not you're still running for president and, and with the second debate coming up and all of that. Why should people continue to talk to Larry Elder? Seeing where you are right now in the race, um, they didn't allow you to come on the first debate stage, and we'll get into that. Why should people continue to talk to Larry Elder? Well, um, I didn't make the first debate stage, in my opinion, Rachel, because I got shafted. Uh, I met all the debate cri criteria. They required me to have 40,000 individual donors. I did. And to submit three polls where I was at 1% or better, and I did. And a few hours after the deadline, I get a phone call from the chairwoman of the GOP, Ronna McDaniel. And she says you're not qualified because one of the polls you submitted uh, is not uh, usable because it's affiliated with Donald Trump. And I said, assuming that's true, why is it my problem? And she said, well, the rules stipulate that any poll affiliated with any candidate cannot be used by any other candidate. And the rules do say that. However, Rasmussen then put out a statement and said, we're not affiliated with Donald Trump. So had I picked up the phone before I submitted the poll and called Rasmussen and said, by the way, I want to make sure you're not affiliated with any candidate, they would have said we're not. And so as far as I was concerned, I got shafted. The Rasmussen poll is a respected poll. It's been used by a Republican for a very long time. It was one of the most accurate ones at predicting that Donald Trump was going to win in 2016. And after I found out I couldn't use that poll, I submitted a fourth poll. And the uh, GOP said you submitted it too late. And it's true, I submitted it after the deadline, but I didn't realize I needed to submit another one, A and B. They concluded the polling before the deadline. So as far as I'm concerned, there was a sufficient amount of wiggle room that the uh, RNC, uh, the, D the GOP, could have put me up there had they wanted to. And not only, Rachel, was I, was I not allowed to uh, go to the uh, to participate in the debate, I was not allowed to go into the arena. They put a sign at the door and said, don't let Elder or his campaign team come in. So I guess now I'm on the RNC terror watch list. As to whether or not I'm still running, as of this moment I am, the next debate uh, is on Wednesday, and we got to have three polls where I'm at 3% or better. And in a few hours, I'll know whether or not I meet that, uh, that criteria. Also, I've got to have 50,000 individual donors as opposed to 40,000 the first time, and I've already exceeded that. So uh, we'll see. I think right now is the coin toss. Why should people still listen to Larry Elder? Real simple. I've got the same, same kind of America first, make America great again agenda that Donald Trump has, but I'm bringing forth some issues that I believe our side does not talk enough about, if at all. Number one, I feel the most important pressing domestic problem in America is the epidemic of fatherlessness. It is particularly acute in the black community where nearly 70 percent of black kids now into the world without a father in the home married to the mother. And nobody, not Republicans, not Democrats, are talking about this. The other, the other big thing that I uh, am bringing to the table uh, is a need for an amendment to the Constitution to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. Otherwise, government gets bigger and bigger, whether Republicans are in charge or Democrats are in charge, largely because what's driving the budget for the most part are the so-called entitlements programs that even Bill Clinton and Barack Obama re referred to as unsustainable. But if you're a politician and you run promising to reform Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, you will lose election because the other side will accuse you of not caring about the sick the poor, the elderly. So the only way to make these kinds of reforms and true cuts uh, is with a law that forces the politicians to do it. The other big thing I talk about is the lie that America remains uh, uh, systemically racist. It's not only a lie that Democrats push in order to get black people scared so they vote Democrat, it's getting people killed. It's called the Ferguson effect or the George Floyd effect. And that's a phenomenon of cops pulling back in every major city uh, and as a result, there are thousands of people who are dead in the last few years who otherwise would not have been killed if the police had been doing their normal proactive policing. And finally, the issue that I'm bringing forth, I know Republicans support school choice, but I don't think they've made the case of how bad urban American K-12 through education is. For example, one city, Baltimore, there were 13 public high schools in Baltimore, I kid you not, where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. Another half a dozen where only 1% can. That's half of all the public high schools in Baltimore, either 0% or just 1% of the kids can do math at grade level. And guess what? They're all located in the inner city. So these are the kinds of things that Larry Old is bringing to the table. And if I'm not the party nominee, if I can get the nominee to begin talking about these things, I've done my job for my party. And more importantly, I've done my job 
for my country. That's why I'm doing this. I want to do a quick, really quick follow up. Something that you said about the RNC and them not letting you into not on the just the debate stage, but even into the arena. You've also said that you believe that the RNC is rigged and it's unfit to lead the GOP. And you said and you made another statement about that you make them uncomfortable. So my question is, do you think the RNC respects you? Because it sounds like they don't. No, no, I don't think they do. I, I don't think I, I think Why? I give them heart. I think I give them heartburn for the reasons I just now mentioned. Right now, for example, we're facing a government shutdown. Uh, and the GOP is proposing some modest cuts. They want to take a pocket knife to a problem that I believe requires a machete. That's why I and I alone am proposing an amendment uh, to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. I think that's a, a conversation that makes them feel uncomfortable. I also think it makes them feel uncomfortable about how blunt I am, about how the Democrats manipulate black people by playing the race card. For example, recently at Howard University, uh, Joe Biden gave a commencement address, and he said the number one threat to the homeland was white supremacy. Are you kidding me? According to the Anti-Defamation League that keeps track of how many people are killed every year by extremists, last year uh, there were 25 people killed by extremists out of, a, out of over 20,000 homicide victims. Now, you want to play that game, most, uh, most murder is same race murder. Most white people who are murdered are murdered by other whites. Most black people who are murdered are murdered by other blacks. However, every year there are about 750 interracial black white homicides. 500 white people killed by blacks 250 black people killed by whites, even though whites have a much bigger pop percentage of the population. Now, if Donald Trump cited those stats I just now gave you, went to a uh, college, gave a commencement exercise, and said the number one threat to the homeland uh, is black supremacy, you and I would denounce him as a race-hustling demagogue and should denounce him as a race-hustling de demagogue. But Biden says it, nobody says a word. A few weeks ago, a racist black man, a racist white man, murdered three black people in Jacksonville, Florida. And Biden made a statement about it, as you would expect him to do so. However, about two or three months ago, uh, a black man got a gun, went up to a white man he didn't know in Tulsa, Oklahoma, shot him in the back of the head, went to another part of Tulsa, Oklahoma, saw another white guy, pulled out the gun, shot him in the back of the head, killed them both, and admitted he did it because they were white. Biden didn't say one word about that. Even though when he made the comment about Jacksonville, he said silence in the face of that kind of hatred makes you complicit. Well, Biden was cited when the uh, black man executed two uh, white men in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Does, it, does that make him uh, complicit? I have said that. I've tweeted this. To my knowledge, nobody else in the GOP said it or even or even talked about it. And I'm making very, I think, pointed comments about the way the Democrats play the race card that I think makes the uh, Republican Party feel uncomfortable. So your long question, uh, long answer to your to your question is, do I feel respected? No, I don't. Hmm. We'll come to some of our disagreements about some of the things that you're saying right now in a second. But before we get to that, I want to stay on you as a candidate for president. What do you feel about your message? Um, that what do you feel about your message, should I say, that isn't resonating with GOP voters? Because I'm looking at polling and you're polling below 1%, right? In a lot of the aggregate polls that I see. Is it a possibility? that what's turning people off about Larry Elder and the GOP is that whether or not you're talking about it in the correct way or not, that you're talking too much about black people. You're talking about fatherlessness and you're talking about that epidemic as it exists in black America. You're talking about schools and how that's affecting black America. You're talking about all of these things. While a lot of people feel like you're denigrating black people. It's There's also a possibility that you're talking too much about black people and therefore the party that you represent and the power base that you represent is uninterested in what it is that you're saying. And if it's not that, why isn't Larry Elder's message resonating with GOP voters? Uh, is that a question? I'm asking you, yeah. Why isn't the, like, what about your message isn't resonating with GOP voters? Well, um, there are a number of ways uh, to respond to that. Uh, the first thing is there's a guy in the race uh, who's dominating the race. He's dominating everybody, including Larry Elder and Will Hurd and Asa Hutchinson and everybody else who's in the race, uh, including Ron DeSantis. His name is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the 10,000 pound elephant in the room. He's box office. He's a rock star. Uh, and he is overwhelmingly dominating this race. So there are other people who have lower numbers than I have who are not talking about the same kind of issue that I'm talking about. 
So the real reason why I'm so behind and why Ron DeSantis is so behind and the others are so behind is because of a gentleman named Donald Trump that a lot of the base respects a great deal. And I, I respect, respect Larry. I'm not, I, just real quick, I'm not asking why you guys are behind. Nobody's going to beat Trump. The, this is a formality. Donald Trump is the Republican nominee for the GOP. I'm, t I'm talking about the lack of support for you in particular. You have Vivek and I, Ramaswamy. I, 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 just, I, just, I just told you that, that I have higher numbers than some of the other ones, including Asa Hutchinson, who's not talking about the same kind of issue that I'm talking about. So there are other people that have less support than I have and others mm -hmm. who have more support than I have. But overwhelmingly, the leader in our party right now is Donald Trump. And that's the 10,000 pound elephant in the room. Hmm. Um, particularly as it re relates to systemic racism, you don't believe that systemic racism exists. You believe that it uh, did exist. Know. Of but it course, doesn't exist now. We had something called slavery. We had something called Jim Crow. Jim Crow, right? Of course, of course. It existed. Today, right now, it tell doesn't me, exist. Tell me okay. where systemic racism exists, please. I'm asking you. There, there are a couple of. I mean, every single measure of American society, there exists a disparity between black people and white people, right? Dis disparity, disparity, and systemic racism are two different things. So I'll ask you this. Then. There, there, I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that. There, there's let, a disparity let, in the in the let, NBA let, regarding let, the number of black players versus let, white players. Lots of disparities. I, I get it. Disparity. What, what I'm in, asking in, you, though, in, I'm in, in, in things like STEM cell research, uh, STEM uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, there are lots of disparities. <laughs> Disparity and systemic racism are two very different things. Where, in your opinion, uh, can a black person not succeed in America today because he's black? Okay. So let's That's go back question. to the let, let's go back that? to the root of it. Let's go back to the root of it. So what okay. I'm asking you is. If there is not systemic racism, how does Larry Elder explain those disparities? Tell me what disparity you're talking about. Will, will it be home ownership, black maternal mortality, whether it be uh, okay, uh, wealth, um, okay. let's, let's talk education? About, let's talk about like if, if, if not for systemic uh, racism, talk, how do you explain those home, disparities? Let's, let's talk about home ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, if the argument is that people who have less money are less likely to own homes than people who have more money, uh, then, uh, then you're right. Uh, there's also a great deal of white poverty, more poor, poor white people in America than there are poor black people. But if you're telling me that a black person with a given... There's a greater raw number. Let's, like, there's a greater raw number because white people outnumber uh, black people in America by a large degree. If we're talking about uh, a percentage or a proportionate number of people who are low income, then obviously we both know that that's not true. So when you say that there are more poor white people in America than there are more than there are more poor black people, then we only make up 13 percent of the population. But if we're talking about numbers and percentages and whether it be in unemployment, whether it be in poverty, black people disproportionately represent those numbers. If we are if there's if the playing field is completely equal and all the the opportunity is there for everyone, I'm simply asking you. Why aren't we doing as well as our white counterparts? Why aren't we doing as well as our white counterparts? Because white people haven't stood still. Uh, black people come out of slavery at the end of the Civil War. White people were ahead. White people are ahead right now. The only way for black people to, quote, catch up is for white people to stand still. They're not standing still. But are black people making progress? Hell yes. 1940, 87% of black people lived uh, under the poverty line. 20 years later, 1960, that number had fallen to 47. That's a 40-point drop in 20 years. That is, by the way, the greatest 20-year period of economic expansion in the history of Black America. Now, why did that happen? Because it, it was rare, rare in 1940 for a Black kid to be raised uh, without a father in the home, married to the mother. Only 17% of Black kids fit that category. Today, uh, it's almost 70% of Black kids entering the world without a father in the home, married to the mother. That accounts for far more of the disparity than any kind of racial uh, incident or racial analysis that, that you want to put forth. That's what the problem is. Uh, we began doing very well until the so-called war on poverty in the mid-60s. Lyndon Johnson launched it, I believe, with the best of intentions. But since then, we've incentivized women to marry the government. We've incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Numbers of Black people entering the world without a father in the home has now been almost triple from what it was in the mid-60s. And by the way, it's also true among white households. It's almost tripled since it was in the mid-60s. You give people an incentive uh, to behave uh, in a certain kind of way where they become dependent, dependent upon government, you're going to have more of that kind of behavior. So the policies that many people have pursued have hurt Black people in the last several generations. Larry, according to that example that you just gave about white people not staying still and Black people having to basically catch up, if that's the case, 
according to your example, will never catch up? Well, collectively, uh, probably not. But individually, can individuals uh, uh, do well? Uh, of course. If you go to school, uh, don't uh, have a kid before you're 20 years old. Oh get married God. first. Get a job. Excuse me? No, no. Go ahead. Finish. We're listening to you. Is there, is there a problem? No, no, no. no, 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 no just no, keep no, going. No, Larry, we're going. listening to you. Go for it. Go, go, get your shit off. According to the uh, Brookings Institution, which is a left-wing think tank, mm -hmm. they've got something, a millennial success sequence. Finish school. Don't have a kid before you're 20. Get married first. Get a job. Keep a job. Don't quit it till you get another job. Avoid the criminal justice system. You will not be poor. If you don't follow that formula, there's a very good chance you will be poor. Why is that so shocking, Rachel? It's not, she's not, I don't, I don't think she's shocked. Larry, I know you want to fight, but like for <laughs> us, like we're, we're because listen, no, no, you, you don't know that I want to fight. Let me, 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 uh, we're going to incentivize poverty and black people just went, we don't want our families anymore. Yeah. And not only do I, I disagree. Is that, is that what I said he said? Well, what you said, said, what, I said, I said with the best of intentions. With the best of intentions, right? With the, with the, with the, with the best of intentions, he tried to help. And then we said, okay, well, since the government's going to be our dad, then we don't want our dads in the homes we anymore. We don't want a family anymore. I, I disagree with that, okay? Oh, and so oh, this I, is what I believe. I said, did so, I say so, black people don't want a family? So, but you're insinuating. What I said, what I said was we gave these incentives. I know, incentives I know, but Larry, but Larry, the same, same disincentive that whites have followed as well. I, I know, but when I'm, but, but Larry, what I'm that's saying what is, well, that's Larry, what I said. Okay, Just so describe what I so, said. I know. So what I'm saying is, I'll put it like this: when the notion is this, when the notion is that, hey, the government came through with a program, and then black men in mass left their homes. And black women decided that we are not going to have men in the home uh, in large portions and in, in, in part and parcel all over the country because we want money from the government. That okay, makes it okay, seem man. like, hold on, hold, on, hold on for a second. Hold on, I know what you're going to say. That makes it seem as oh, No, you don't know what I'm going to say, Dan. In, in I, fact, I, I do. You're good. Since you know what I'm going to say, why don't you just have the interview by yourself without me sitting here? Since you know what that I'm actually would be, that, that no, would be fine. No, but look, no idea what you're going to say. But, but look, so... That to me says, hey, the black people made the decision either um, intentionally or subconsciously to forego family in order to bring the government into their household. That that's the I'm deducing that from what you're saying. Now, this no. is what I believe happened. This is what I believe happened, Larry. I believe coming out of slavery into Reconstruction, black Americans did what they were supposed to do. They went out and bought large tracts of land everywhere. In the 1910s in this country, black people owned more land than they do now. They attempted to do America in the way that America said that it should be done. They opened up banks. They opened up schools. They had hospitals all over the place. And through two things, both of them systemic, one of them just outwardly violent and racist, white terrorism and usury, usury being in the form of contract buying schemes, other intellectual ways to uh, defraud people out of their homes and out of their land, heirs' property rights, all of those things, wealth was taken from Black America. I've heard you talk about before Tulsa, right? And how Tulsa actually became known as Black Wall Street after it was burned down. And that's a very astute point, right? It wasn't until after it was burned to the ground that it became known as Black Wall Street because the Black people there rebuilt. What you don't talk about and what a lot of people don't talk about is that after Tulsa was rebuilt, years after that, and they were thriving and they were doing well, that urban renewal came through and plowed a highway through Greenwood and effectively ended that black hub of wealth that the people had persevered and half for themselves and urban renewal something that has gone on all over this country has particularly and disproportionately affected black home ownership, which is a key wealth building tool. And it's also displaced a lot of black people. So I do feel like 
in, I guess, your analysis of what's gone on with black people and with the history of us in this country, you do fixate on what you feel like we're doing wrong, which I think is a very important conversation to have. And I don't think anyone that wants better for black people would be against having that conversation. And there doesn't seem to be the willingness to have an open and honest dialogue about the challenges that we face. And to me, I think that's what the disservice is. I think I, I'm not going to I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, we don't need to have a conversation about some of the things that go on in our community. And we don't need to have a conversation about some of the expectations that we should be having uh, amongst each other uh, in our community. But I think the problem is that you do these things in a vacuum without acknowledging like really obvious realities about the black experience. And I'm just wondering why you do that. Uh, well, I disagree with virtually everything you just now said. That's why I do that. <laughs> I, I As I said, I said yeah. before, 1940, 87% of Blacks lived under the poverty line. This mm -hmm. is before uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64, before Brown versus, Edu versus Board of Education. KKK was still alive and well. Next 20 years, poverty fell almost 40, 40 points. The greatest 20-year period of economic expansion in America in black and history for Black America. Why? Because of a belief in Judeo-Christian values, a belief in patriotism, even as those values were not being applied fairly to Black people, uh, a belief in the nuclear intact family, and a belief in entrepreneurship. All of those things are right now under assault by organizations like Black Lives oh, Matter. Oh, okay, can I, can I, can I, may I finish? I didn't cut yeah, you, you off. No, you, yeah, you, you all, have, all, all, all the things that, that uh, I just now mentioned are now under assault uh, by organizations like Black Lives Matter, which on their website uh, criticize the nuclear intact family. Uh, by definition, they don't support entrepreneurship because they are self-described trained Marxists. Marxists was not somebody who believed in capitalism. And Marx also wanted to, quote, dethrone God. So the very principles that Black people followed, following things like slavery and uh, uh, the Great Depression, are now under assault right now by people on the left, and I would dare say by people like you. Oh, fine. Um, I accept that. Look, um, 1940, you, you, you mentioned, right? And you mentioned the, the wealth that was built like after 1940 for black people, um, what happened between 1940 and 1970 or whatever? Like what happened? Do you, like what, what, huge, what huge, what huge happening in, in, in American history? The, the welfare state. No, well, I mean, well, the welfare state happened as well, but you know what else happened? Uh, World War II. And when World War II happened, Larry, it wasn't just what the wealth of black people that exploded. Of course, you know, that after World War II, post-World War II, there was an industrial boom in the country itself to where the wealth of everybody in the country, America itself, after the destruction of Germany, after the destruction of Japan, two manufacturing hubs that would go on to compete with America in manufacturing, America had a 10 to 15 year run of being completely unchallenged in manufacturing. We came home, we got to work. The war machine itself was a particularly robust economic uh, 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 engine for America. And the, the economy of the country grew, gave rise to places like Detroit, gave rise to places throughout the Rust Belt that had thriving industries for people to work in out here in Compton where they were building tires for rubber, for, like for, for, for cars, rubber plants for cars, tires, stuff like that. What would happen after that was those jobs went away. And when those jobs went away, some of the systemic issues that existed in those cities were exacerbated, particularly in places like Detroit. So I've heard you say before, you talk about 1940 and you talk about as it relates to poverty and crime, but there seems to be huge gaps in the general history, both economic and societal of America in your analysis. Yeah, black people were doing better after 1940. They were. America, by and large, was doing better because of a huge economic boom that happened that really an eighth grader with a base level, a base understanding of American history should be able to kind of make those points and understand that. What I'm asking you is the disparities in education, the disparities in economics, the disparities in all of those things that exist for black people, like standard of life, quality of life, environmental access, 
access to food, access to all of these things. Larry, access to banking, access to banking. When you talk about the decimation of black banks, when we talk about all of these things, I'm wondering, is America possibly not playing the same game with us that it is with everybody else? Or is your answer to that entire glob of inequity basically that niggas ain't shit? Really, Van? <laughs> that's, that's, that's your question? <laughs> I'm asking are, are, you, my friend. I'm are asking you, you. You're like you're you're ta you're talking about these things, and you're and you're leaving such gigantic gaps in the actual yeah, to me said, you just the structural said. history of America. How, so, how do you explain the land loss, Larry? Black people did exactly what Larry Elder wanted them to do. Black people, they went. They bought land, they own land, they had this land all over the place. Once again, you guys, this is all up and down in any book, any text that you want to read will tell you about this. How did we lose all the land? We just no, like, not, like what, no, what, not, what? no, not any text you want to read. I don't know what text you're reading. I, I disagree with virtually everything you just now said. Let's talk oh, about right, 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 right. So you uh, just real quick, you disagree. You disagree with the with the with the Irrefutable fact that black people own more land in 1905 oh, and 1910 than they do now. Let, let's do talk do about, you disagree with that? Let's talk about mortgages because you seem to suggest that black people are not getting loans that they are qualified for. And they're not getting loans because of racism. Uh, 1995, a young civil rights lawyer named Barack Obama filed a class action lawsuit against city group joining other lawyers, arguing that 186 of black people who applied for mortgages at city group were not getting them because they were black. Citigroup says, no, you're not getting them because you're not credit worthy. We want to make sure that if we loan people money, we get the money back plus interest, which is how we make profits uh, as running a bank. But because of the lawsuit, Citigroup said, OK, gave the loans to 186 uh, of black people. Fast forward several years later, virtually every single one of them failed to keep his or her home because they were not able to make the payments, which shows you that they were not being discriminated against. Their credit uh, score uh, and record was not sufficient to qualify them for a mortgage. So it didn't help them. In fact, it made them worse off. It is simply not true that credit worthy black borrowers are being denied loans just because they're black. It is simply flat out not true. It is widely believed, but it's not true. Well, according to the Brookings Institute that you uh, cited earlier on, it actually is true. Um, because right here, when you're I I'm looking at it in plain black and white, it says that credit credit worthiness like there's studies on this, actual studies all over the place. Once again, it takes very, all, very, all very, the Washington Post did a study. I have a study right now from the Brookings Institute and it says, even in instances right here, this is their study, I can send it to you Larry. There's nothing I'm telling you right now that I can't make, make available to you. Like even right here, it says, even in instances where there is uh, uh, comparable credit worthiness, you, you, you still see in raw studies, black people not having access to home loans I've seen, at I've the seen. same rate of white people. So whatever you're talking about right now with the young lawyer, Barack Obama, I like him too. I'm telling you right now that, th that the things that you're saying, they no, have no, been I'm studied no. and they no. have been looked at and the data on it, Larry, the actual data, not Van Lathan, not as smart as Larry Elder, the data on it like refutes what you're saying. And what I'm what I'm asking you is if there's data right here. This is from Brookings Institute right now. It's on it's on my computer. I've heard this spiel before. Like so I'm looking at it right now. If you would tell me that Brookings says something, hey Van, you believe them they're left leaning. Fine, you use it. I'm looking at it right now. Why won't you believe this? Like what what is it about the the, not, the allegiance to your true. narrative? Suggest, what is it about I, the allegiance to your I narrative that you, stops suggest, you from wanting to look at facts as they are directly in your face? I don't understand. I suggest I suggest you read work by Walter Williams, read works by by Thomas Sowell. Both what makes you think I haven't read Sowell? What makes you think I haven't read him? Well, My man Killer Mike. Shout out to Killer Mike. My man Killer Mike got me on Thomas Sowell. What makes you think I haven't read it? Well, well, apparently you don't believe what he's saying because he's saying the opposite of what you're just now saying. She's not true. I, I, I don't think I don't. I, 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 I don't think it's a Bible. If you look at community banks, 
those that are owned by black people in the community, they are more likely to turn down people who apply for loans than the non-community banks. So why, why, why would that be the case? You know why? It's because they're not property capitalized. They're not properly capitalized. So I mean, they can't afford to take a risk on somebody who's not. I'm gonna pull a Larry. I'm gonna pull a Larry Elder on you. I mean, they can't afford to take a risk on somebody. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna pull a Larry Elder on you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer the. Let me answer the question. That's a great question. And to anybody that's, uh, that's listening to this, what Larry just said is true. Community banks, banks that you would say are from the community owned by black people. They are a little bit more stingy with loans it's because they have less access to capital. They have less access to capital. So people defaulting on those loans from those banks could actually send those banks oh, into so receivership in words, or, so in or words, destroy them. And what, I, what words, I'm telling banks, you is- Banks don't lend money to people who are not credit worthy. So, so also, when, I, when, also, I, like, when, I, when I'm like, when I, when also, telling you Asian, is- Also, you're an Asian would-be borrower for uh, a mortgage. You're, you're more likely to have your application accepted than a white person. So when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm telling you, against white and, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to cut racial out of this. So I'm, I'm sorry. But what I'm telling you right now is even the fact that black banks, which by the way have been destroyed over the past forty or fifty years, when we are apparently accumulating all of this wealth, you're going down from like a minuscule have, amount have, of black banks. Destroyed. Now, and, and so, and so what, 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 I'm, what I'm telling you right now is, Larry, even the fact that those banks yeah, they haven't been destroyed. have less they haven't been destroyed. access to they capital, they even the fact been destroyed. that those banks have less access to capital is another function of the disparities in wealth between black people and white people. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to let Rachel jump in. Rachel. Wait, what was it that you're about to say? Because I guess I, I get know. a little. Go ahead, Larry. I was going to say they haven't been destroyed. It's that people have been able to get uh, loans from other banks. And so for, therefore the need for a so-called community bank uh, is less and less as we go forward. Well, well, well hold, hold, real quick, real quick, real quick. There is a need for community banks. And let me tell you what that need is. The need for community banks has to do more than with more than loans, right? When you look at black people in terms of some of the financial hardships that they have, some of the unique challenges that they face, access to banking is important, right? So if you don't have the internet, right? Or you don't have uh, money to have, get. Black people, to, don't, black people don't have the internet. I'm not saying they don't have the internet, Larry. The, uh, Larry, the Larry, the employment, the Larry. Employment rate man for a married black man is the same Larry, as employment. Larry, Larry, person. Larry, Larry. That, that's a that's a very Larry, important. I'm not saying black people don't have the internet. What I'm telling married, you is that the the, um, the unemployment rate for a married black man is the same as the unemployment rate for for the average white person. I don't know if that has to do with what we're talking. Why, why but like, but, but when I like when I'm what like, like when I'm when I'm telling you is just just listen real quick. Just listen. I'm saying that I'm not saying black people don't have the internet. What I'm saying is there are huge swaths of places, places like shout out to, I mean, even people like Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott in South Carolina realize that there are people in rural areas and semi-rural areas, places like Monk's Corner, places like that, that didn't have access to Internet. Another reason, another way that I know this, Larry, is because there's more white, there's just, more white just, poverty just, than, than there is okay, black. Okay, poverty. okay, cool. The, the, another way that I, uh, another way that I know yeah. this is when the schools closed because of COVID. Right, I worked with HBCUs, and one of the largest issues that you had during that time is whether or not kids could get their schoolwork done because they didn't have access to internet other than what they were getting at school. There were kids going to Taco Bells or, or, or in Burger Kings or sitting next to McDonald's and Starbucks using their Wi-Fi trying to get their work done. And the reality was that they underestimated how much the internet existed for some of these kids. And what I'm saying is the importance of community banks doesn't just have to do with loans. Loans is an important aspect of it. But the importance of community banks also, Larry, has to do with proximity, having a bank in your community at a place that you can readily get to with people who understand you. And what I'm saying is when you're not capitalized, when you don't have those places nearby, when those places are filled with check cashing joints that are pernicious, that offer all kinds of crazy interest rates, when those places are filled with payday loan joints, always, what you do black, is you take okay. black people always, and always you put them in right a man. situation when you put you take black people and you put them in a situation when you turn when you talk about people who are unbanked to where they're now behind the eight ball financially because they don't have access to the same services. All of these things are realities. I'm not saying, Larry, 
that what you're saying has no merit. I'm saying that you are for some reason choosing to only dip your toe into the issues that face black America and then turn around with the narrative oh, and, that pleases getting, white American getting, power. Getting, and I'm wondering I'm getting, why you're doing I'm getting, it. I'm getting, I'm getting a headache, man. Can I, can I say something? Thank you. One more time. Black people are not victims anymore. It is now 2020. Well, we never were. Get an education. Mm -hmm. finish high school. Don't have a kid before you're 20 years old. Get married first. Get a job. Keep a job. Don't quit it to get another job. Avoid the criminal justice system. You will not be poor. That is the formula for success in America. That's the formula you ought to be telling people instead of telling people that you are a victim, which is what you are, ta are talking about. You and uh, uh, our friend here, Rachel, have been basically saying, woe with black people. We're oppressed. And it's nonsense. We're not oppressed. Work hard. Get an education. Make Me? sure that you don't get involved in the criminal justice system. You will not be poor. That Wait, is a message I we ought to be sending, sending black people. But that's not what I'm hearing from you. What I'm hearing from you is, oh, my God, black people can't get along. False. Oh, my God. Uh, black people are oppressed. <laughs> okay. False. Oh, my God. Black people uh, were uh, discriminated against and we remain discriminated against. False. Oh, my God. There are disparities. Therefore, it must be systemic racism. False. I don't accept that at all. I think, Larry, what becomes frustrating is that there seems to, and I think this is what, what Van was is saying, that you don't accept challenges or like the reality of what's happening in 2023. You say the systemic racism existed at a time, but you act as if, I, I'll let you talk, you, you act as if it doesn't, it doesn't exist today. And when what is, you talk the, what about, is the reality of, that exists today? Tell me what it is. Okay. When you talk about we were talking about home ownership and loans and how there's this, this disparity when it comes to white people and minorities. You talk about a case in 1995. If you just look at today, there's currently a huge settlement, the largest ever with City National Bank for discriminating against black people when it comes to redlining and cutting them out of homes and giving them loans. You look at Wells Fargo, they're about to settle a huge suit right now with black people because they were denying them lower uh, lower interest rates and weren't allowing them to refinance their mortgages while they were allowing or loans, it's and they were allowing white people to do that. That's 2023. Both of those examples are 2023. It's still happening. Those disparities exist because it happened back in the day, but it's still happening in 2023. If it wasn't, why are they settling? Oh, you settle for all sorts of reasons. You settle because you don't want the, the bad PR. Uh, you settle because it's less expensive uh, than litigating the matter. Or because it's why, true why and it, you don't want the discovery to come why, out and everyone why, to find why out. Is it, why is it when banks make their profit by lending money to creditworthy people, why would I not want to lend money to a creditworthy person, A? And B, if it's true, why then are community banks doing so poorly, uh, as uh, as Van just now said? Given the fact that there are all these creditworthy Black people uh, who could get loans, who aren't getting loans because the band doesn't want to give them a loan, why then aren't Black community uh, banks thriving? Seems to me that the huge market for it, why aren't they thriving? They, 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 the, the capital hasn't been made available to black people. We need better. Let me ask you a question. Larry, you talk well, about education. Uh, Larry, 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 Larry. No, you didn't answer my question. Larry, you Larry, you, 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 like, 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 Larry, you got it. You got it. So it's score not, one for you, Larry. Let, let me ask you a question. Um, you talk about and education. There, and and, by, the, and by, the, by the way, the reason for the uh, recession that we had in 2006, 2007, 2008. You're going to blame that on black people. Is because of this lie that uh, banks were not lending to creditworthy people. Uh, people like Bill Clinton uh, put teeth in the Community Reinvestment Act and basically punished banks who were not lending uh, in, in ways that they thought they ought to lend. Uh, and as a result, the whole lending criteria for banks uh, essentially went away. You, you could fog up a mirror, you got a loan. Between, okay. 20, between 2010 and 2013, Black net worth fell almost a third. Why? Because a lot of Black people had loans, got homes that they couldn't afford because of all the pressure put on banks to lend to people that were, quote, non-traditional borrowers. And it ended up hurting the very people that uh, people on the left wanted to help. So it didn't help anybody okay. by changing so, the standards. So this this is this is a, a, a good example of a fundamental difference that we would have. Um, and I'm taking everything that you're saying in good faith. You're, but this, you're, but this, you're, but, you're, but this you're is, entitled to a different opinion. You're not entitled to different facts. It is a fact right, but, but, but I'm, not, I'm not giving you different facts. Thirty percent. I'm not giving you different facts. I'm not giving you different facts. Got homes that they shouldn't have gotten. I, I, wouldn't I have gotten had their right. criteria not changed. Black, it is black, 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 black. All of America was responsible for the financial crisis. But listen, if you ask me, so therefore that's it. But look, but look, but look, but look, Larry, Larry, let me finish. Larry, this is important. Larry, 
Larry, you, this is important. This is important. Something called the Commission on the Larry. Financial Crisis. I Larry. urge you to read, to read the report and read the one that was filed by Republicans. Larry, uh, and they talk about Larry, how the this, is, this, is in, this is important. All because of these social reasons, uh, and it hurt the very people that black people. <laughs> Larry, uh, Larry this is important. This is important. This is important because this. I, this I think under, what I said was important too. I, I, it, it is. It is. I, 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 I receive it, Larry. But what I would say is this. I'm sure you did. But. We. I did. I do. I do. I've heard. By the way, just to be honest with you, like um, I under I understand the point of view that people want to wanna say. I understand the point of view that people say that uh, risky borrowers and non-traditional customers were re responsible for the financial crisis. I, I, I understand that. I've heard that point of view. I look at that a different way. I look at that as uh, predatory practices, um, CDOs, uh, rating systems, and playing with actual money that began in the 70s, right? That And then persisted on throughout until the 90s, uh, being able to mortgage-backed securities and how you take a mortgage-backed security and then put that out there to make that in a way. Okay, you don't want to hear this. Hold on, hold on, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You don't want to hear this. The reason why you don't want to hear this is because you, no, I, no, I, I feel like no, sometimes, wait, wait, hold no, on, hold on. No, I feel like sometimes. I don't want to hear it is because wait, it's not wait, true. Wait, wait, it's I, not I feel true. like sometimes it's on the right, true. you guys want, you want it both ways. You say that it's both the uh, that the strength of America is in the the average ordinary American in their earning, but also when America fails, it's not because people who want to buy houses were told that they could buy houses by people who knew that they couldn't buy them. Number one, and then number two, played with money in a way to create a new form of security so that they can then go trade it on the market, right? And make untold sums of money that on top of the regulatory capture that existed when those same people at Goldman Sachs and all of those other places who have been put in charge of the treasury, who had so much influence over the Fed, then turn around and bailed out all of their friends and left the American people, the American people that you say and the Republicans say are the lifeblood of this country left let, them let, holding let me, the let me, bag, right? Let me, let me and then, like, let, 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 let me, them let holding the bag, here. and then you want to come around and say it wasn't the system of 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 credit ratings and the bogus credit ratings. I mean, people lost their entire pensions in that. Let, let, people let lost all respond. of their money in that. It's not let, Kenneth let, Lane let know, Enron let, from let before. Done, it's I not all respond. of those other people. It is the American who wanted to buy a home and was told that they could buy a home by greedy banks and done. funds and all of those. It's their fault. And then not only is it not their fault, it's the black Americans' fault. We can agree to disagree there, because I want to ask you one more thing. We can agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. Was that, was that a question? No, no, it was a response. I didn't, I didn't we can so. agree to disagree, Larry. Larry, I want to agree to disagree. We have to be able to do that as two people who love black people. Okay, so I'm going to ask you something else. No, um, no. I want to say, no. I'm you, asking you, your, you, your listeners to read, to read the... Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Read nope. both the majority report and the minority report. Okay, uh, and that explains the minority report exactly what happened and what. Got Van, that? Said, okay. What Van just now said is pure, unadulterated. It's, it's absolutely true, guys. But that's okay. A difference of opinion. That's okay. Um, so Van, Van said you, it's true. It must be true. You you brought up because Larry said it's true. Education. That's a way not to be poor. I'm wondering why high school educated whites make more than college educated blacks. You have to be specific. If you ask okay. me So so what I'm, I'm, okay so what, what I'm asking what I'm asking you if you, if you compare okay. apples to apples, people with the same educational uh, uh, scores, uh, people have been in the same corporation for the same period of time, uh, whether you're talking about blacks or whites or men versus women, there's no difference in their income. Okay, you talk I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, hold on for a second. This is the, this is the issue. You guys, you guys, all of this stuff, I just want everyone listening to the sound of my voice to know. This is not Van Lathan that's telling you this. This is literally say, say, the I, Department I, I of Labor that keeps nope. track on these statistics. Department of Labor says like the opposite households, of households that I'm, I'm are sorry. led sorry, by man. households that are led Man's by high school educated whites who do not have bachelor degrees. 
out earn, have more wealth and income than households that are run by college educated blacks that have a bachelor's degree. Apples. I'm asking Larry Elder why that is. I'm, and I'm responding. Larry Elder is responding. If Van will allow Larry Elder to respond. Thank the you. Labor Department says the opposite of what you just now said. If you compare apples to apples, people with the same kind of educational background have not left the office, have not taken time out in order, for example, to have children the way women do. You compare apples to apples, there's no difference uh, in the income of point A and point B. Sorry, it's just not true. When you compare different categories, of course there are differences. Men make more money than women do uh, as a whole. But if you compare a man with the same kind of background as a female, same industry, same educational background, and the woman has not taken time out to have children, for example, there's no difference in their income, according to the Department of Labor. You have the statistics from the Department of Labor it's, as it's, well? It's, it's, it's right there. By the way, shout out to Sandy Darity. But look, just I, I want to ask one more question. And then we really thank you for being so generous with your time, Larry. Seriously, it's LarryElder.com. You guys can go. Um, you said shout out, shout out to Sandy Darity. He's an he's a, uh, economics professor. A uh, shout out to Walt Williams and, and Thomas Sowell, who say the opposite. Okay, cool. Um, you say that CR CRT, DEI cults are increasing and not decreasing racial tension in America. What do you feel like would decrease racial tension in America? Uh, if people recognize that they're not victims, uh, they're, not, they're not entitled to things like reparation because of things that happened to other people that didn't happen to them. Uh, if people like Barack Obama, when he got elected, had followed through on what I think people thought he was going to follow through on, uh, which was to be a healer as opposed to somebody who picked up the race card uh, and played the race card time and time again uh, during the eight years he was president. For example, when Barack Obama ran, uh, he was uh, in the primary. He was being interviewed on 60 Minutes. And Steve Croft, the correspondent, asked him, Senator, if you don't win, will it be because of race? And Senator Obama said, no, if I don't win, it will be because I've not articulated a vision that the American people can embrace. Before he became president, he gave a speech uh, at a historical um, black church. And he said that the Moses generation, referring to the generation of MLK, has, quote, gotten us 90 percent of the way there, close quote. Uh, he said, my generation, the Joshua generation, has to get us an additional 10 percent, which I thought was accurate. Uh, he fast forward, becomes president. And he says racism is in America's DNA. Uh, he says that uh, if it's I had a son, it's a fact. Racism in America is older than America. That's a fact. He said if I had a son, he looked like uh, Trayvon. He said the Cambridge police acted stupidly. He embraced Black Lives Matter. His attorney general, Eric Holder, uh, called voter ID an example of pernicious racism. He had Al Sharpton, one of the biggest race hustlers in America, in the White House over 70 times. So that when he left office, both blacks and whites thought race relations got worse. When he entered office, blacks and whites thought race relations would get better. He played the race card time and time and time again and made things worse. And as a result, a lot of black people are behaving like victims uh, rather than victors, which is what we really are. Okay. Last thing I'll say, um, just real quick. There's another interview that I remember before an election, and it was from, you love Donald Trump, I'm assuming. And so, I, you, you're a big fan of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, during an interview, was asked about David Duke. We talk about presidents and interviews that they did before they were president. Now, Larry, I know that you and I both know, because we're smart. Can you finish your point? He was asked about David Duke, meaning what? He was asked about the fact that David, the, the, he was asked about the fact that David Duke supported him. Okay. That David Duke said that he supported Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, hold on real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. When we talk and Donald about Trump race. Reject, reject, rejected his support. Remember that? Okay. Okay. No. no. By, the way, the, by the way, the imperial, the imperial Donald, was just, just playing okay. in California. See, see what you're doing? You're, bro, bro, you're, you're, you're so anxious to defend Donald Trump, you won't even let me finish. Donald Trump was asked about David Duke, and what Donald Trump says is, I don't know him, I don't know who that is. That's so, right. So therefore what? Motherfucker, we know that Donald Trump knows who David Duke is. 
We also, they're, so they're, absolutely. So hold on, wait, 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 no, 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 Larry, 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 Larry. We know for certain that he, like, we know for certain that Donald Trump knows who David Duke is. We know for certain because Donald Trump has insulted. Wait, 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 stop, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Like, let's see, Larry, 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 Larry. The we know for certain that he knows who he is because he has this. Hurt, hurt hold on, wait, wait, Larry, let me finish. Else. Larry, let me finish. Larry, 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 it's a whole Calvin Candy situation here. Let me finish. We know for certain because he had what dissed, a ridiculous thing to say. We had we had this David. He had this David Duke in the past. He had insulted him. We know. Oh, so, so wait, 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 wait. So Larry, just let me finish. So Larry, hang, please. So, Larry. So the pen, the pen you're hanging your Donald Trump as a racist add on. Larry, one Larry, time Larry, Larry, I'm not saying. Larry, he said Larry, he listen. Do. Larry, Therefore, Larry, he was Larry. 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 Probably Larry. has a in the, in the Oval Office, right? Larry, Larry, Larry. What listen, a silly listen. thing to say, Ben. That's all you got? Larry, I'm asking. Larry, you talked about. Oh, you're not asking Obama. me anything. You're making you're making a diatribe against Donald Trump. I'm not making I, a diatribe. Therefore, you I'm a bad guy because I support Larry, Donald Trump. And Larry, Donald Larry, Trump's you can support what whoever you want. To say? Larry, I couldn't care less. What I'm telling you right now is that you said uh, you, you talked about what you felt like Barack Obama could have done to stem the racial tide and calm some of the racial animus that exists in America. All right, you feel like that's a fair point. I'm not going to argue that with you. I don't. I don't think that he had any. I don't think that it was necessary for him to do any of that, but some people probably did, and that's fine. He was the president of an entire nation. That's fine. That's fine. That's a realistic expectation for you or somebody else. Okay, so just listen. Just let me finish. What I would hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What I would expect somebody who was running for president to say when they're asked about the most notorious grand wizard in the history of the Ku Klux Klan to say is, "I 1,000% reject support from that guy. I think that his entire life." That he is devoted oh, to so dehumanizing and devaluing black people therefore, is a whole Donald sham, and I'm not doing for that. And it. your guy obfuscated at that question rather than answer it, and, why, and and you don't want to hold him to the same standard that you that. would hold Barack Obama to. Because I'm to trying say. to tell you, Larry, Hillary there's is something one. here. Hillary Clinton is, is the first one to bring Larry, up that Larry, Obama there's, might Larry, not be there's Hillary, something here. Racist. I don't know what it is, bro, but there's something here. When I, we talk about people not judging us I by the same standard. I know you don't know standard. what it is, bro. You're, you're not judging us by the same standard. You, you listen to me, you hear some things, bro. Ooh. Hillary Clinton brought brought up that Obama was not from uh, from from America and that uh, he was from Africa. Why are you acting like I'm a fan of Hillary Clinton? That make her a racist? Why, why are you acting like I'm not a fan of Hillary Clinton? Why did hey, I bring hey, her up? Hey, why did hey, you bring Trump up? Larry, why did you bring her up? Why did you bring Larry, Trump? Larry, Larry, let me throw you a bone real quick. Why did you bring I, Trump up and didn't bring her up? Larry, let me throw you a bone. What about real Chuck quick. Schumer, 1974? Larry, Larry, Chuck Schumer Larry, had a Larry, bunch Larry, of racist Larry, 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 let me throw you a bone real quick. Let me throw you a bone. Because you think I'm a Democrat. That's the that's the issue here. You think I'm a Democrat. I think white supremacy. I, I don't know what you are. I so, think I think you're I so, think you're so, incoherent. So listen, so listen, just real quick, real quick. I think you're incoherent. Real quick, real quick. I could be. You have no you have no idea what caused the housing meltdown. Like you have no idea. Well, I don't think you know. You have no you have no idea about what to be telling black people instead of telling them that they're victims. I think you're I think you know. And I, and I think you're making things worse. I, we, I'm not a we don't believe that black people are victims. Look at this. Larry, 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 That's a fact. These cases are it's, it's actually true. out Larry, there. look at this chain. Bro, you know how much this costs? You think I'm a victim? Come on, man. I know you got the man. But Larry, I'm not, a, I'm not, what I'm telling you right now is, this is the only thing I'm saying to you. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. Did. Larry, Larry, I'll let it go. People, then, is to do what I did. Work hard. I work hard, too. First, you're talking I, to I, me. I just not said that. Right. I said, tell people, I said, tell people to do what I've done. Van, you've worked hard. I've tell worked people hard. To, you persevere. Tell people to persevere. I will persevere. I, I, I will tell people. them to persevere. And, what I will tell them to be hurt, and listen, listen, that listen. The man's out to get listen, you that they want money to No, 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 no. All nonsense. Let me finish. I'll tell them, I'll tell them to persevere in the face of the obstacles that are realistic to them. And I think you would say that. And I, and, I would say, that? and I would say, I think you what agree is, what with is the that. Obstacle, what is the obstacle a black kid faces in America today? Larry Elder. Oh, really? Larry, let me ask you this. That, me, gonna, no, 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 gonna, wait, 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 stop, stop. Hold, hold on real quick. I'm sorry, Rachel. I apologize. Pretty, Larry that, Elder. That's, that's pretty the, insulting. Like, the, the obstacle that a, that a black kid faces insulting. Because, and, I, because and I don't believe the, black people are victims, no, therefore, no, I'm an no, 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 no. Wow. It's not about being a victim. Wow. 
Because the only way for you to make sure that cancer kills you is as if you pretend that it doesn't exist. The only way to make sure that whatever is up against that kill you is, is to, is to pretend exist. like it doesn't exist. So the so only, the only, the only way, way that racism people, wins, the only way that racism wins, the only way that inequality wins, the only way that, that homophobia exist. wins, I, I the only way that systemic, never, the systemic racism exist. wins, I never said the only way those things win, Larry, the only way that they win is to pretend that they don't exist. And you represent a side of this argument that wants to pretend that they don't exist. So what I would say is any person, anybody who wants to look at the country in the way that it is now and historically that has a plan, I'll listen to them. But if somebody that tells me that it's not raining when the rain's falling so clearly, that I cannot get into. I never said racism doesn't exist. Right to what so, so you believe? Oh, you I, have believe. No, I have no, so I have no idea to whom you are are directing that uh, uh, that diatribe. I never said racism doesn't exist. I said that racism is no longer a factor in holding people back. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch it because you, this was you finish high school or have a kid before you're 20 years old. Get married first. Get a job. Avoid the criminal justice system. You will not be poor, irrespective of your race. That's what I said. This is the last thing for me. You were you are running your campaign. Is it Save America? It's what what I, I want to say it right. What what's your campaign slogan? We have a country to save. Is my slogan. We have a country to save, and you're base. You're talking about fatherlessness, and that there's this epidemic in the black community of fatherlessness. And I, excuse me if I've missed it, but to date, what have you done to combat fatherlessness in the black community? Okay, so you're accepting that we have an issue with fatherlessness in the black community. You're accepting that, I assume. Actually, no, actually, don't. No, but I, I'm go not. Ahead. You said okay, that. I, I, but you said that. I, I didn't think so. So, so you're you're not accepting it, and you're asking me, what am I doing about something that you well, don't no, accept? No, you're you're my well, is, is my, my question is clear as day. <laughs> you say that that it exists. You say that I like you say that this exists. I'm acknowledging that. I'm acknowledging your you just, statement. You just, you just, you just, you just out said you weren't acknowledging it. So now you're no, acknowledging it. No, I said I don't agree with it. I'm acknowledging what you have said. You have said that there's okay, this so, epidemic. So, so the question so just is, what so you have you, you done? You don't agree that there is. I just want to understand what the question is, Rachel. So you don't the agree that there's is, an epidemic. The question is, I'll say it. I'll say it. Would you, 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 you want to know what Larry only would do about something that you don't Larry, think exists? Larry, I'm not, I'm not going, right? but I'm asking you a very clear question. Not even long-winded. The question is, what have you done? Sorry, okay, clear. what have you done? To what, what, what have I done to address a problem that you don't think exists? So do you want not want to answer? You don't have to answer because I think that's the answer. Is that do you have you not done anything to combat fatherlessness? You are, you, are, you, you you just now acknowledged in your opinion that what I just now said wow. isn't even a problem. It's and a now clear, you're asking me. What have you done? Asking, have you done anything? It's a problem that you don't think is a problem. Larry, we gotta go. Larry, hold on, hold I'll on. take that as a no. <laughs> yeah, we, I'll Larry, take that as Larry, a no. Go. That's a very simple question. Uh, well, let, no, Larry, give a, t- tell them where to go. LarryLD.com, no. So we got to go, go, Larry. You don't like, like, like you are, we can't, you we can't do that now. You are not yeah, you got to at least, that's the woman in the house. You got to at least, I'm not going to be And now you want me to do, to answer what It's your campaign, Larry. Larry, this is your campaign. Your campaign is about fatherlessness. I'm asking you to, I'm giving you the floor to talk about how you have combat fatherlessness because you say it is such an issue in this country and you don't want to answer the question. I'm happy to answer the question. Provided that you acknowledge that there is a problem, I'm Larry, get the fuck out of here! Like, like, like that's 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 Larry Elder, guys. LarryElder.com. Uh, he's got a lot of other things. He actually says a couple of things on here. I will say that I do agree with. Oh, so, talks so, to- so, Rachel, you're ending you're ending this interview, not agreeing that there is an epidemic of fatherlessness, but you're it, upset it, with me it, for it, not it, addressing it. a problem that you does not think exists. Correct? Okay. You can put it back what on me, Larry. Larry. That's, that's fine. Everybody yeah. can see yeah. you did not answer the question. So, so I'm happy. I, no, no, you, you, you did not acknowledge that there is even a problem, and you want me to how 
ask how I would address a problem that you don't even think exists. Okay, Larry, 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 we've been Larry, disagreeing this Larry, entire Larry, Larry, podcast quick, and you've been answering Larry, the Larry, questions Larry, that have been given to you. Let me, let me tell you why I say what I say because I think you're taking my answer and attributing it to Rachel. But this is what I said. Like, uh, according to the CDC, 58% of black, black fathers live with one or more of their children and even a larger majority, 72.7% of black fathers talk with their children about things that happen uh, that day several times a week or more. So, real quick, just so people Sorry. know this. Black fathers, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Real quick. Black fathers, 70% were I more likely response. to have bathed, dressed, hope, diapered, get, or helped their response. children use the toilet every day right. compared with white and Hispanic fathers. I'm not saying that we don't need to address fatherlessness. What I am saying is whether or not have, rather than have a holistic conversation about the changing dynamic of the American family in totality and how it looks, sometimes black men get demonized by right wing talking points, acting like they don't love their children. I'm I mean, never ever gonna like uh, 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 like have a disagreement with someone who wants to talk about the importance of fathers. Larry, I had okay, a, uh, okay, wait, let me finish, let me finish, Larry. I've heard you talk about your father. I've heard the way that you revere your father and I connect with you on that. I lost my father two years ago. He was my hero. He was a small business owner, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, owned TNT Construction, a, uh, a, a subcontracting company. He went out and we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a city in Louisiana, in the South, that's dominated by white contractors, made a living for his family every single day, taught me his business, taught me the value of hard work, taught me the value of responsibility, of protecting your family, taught, taught me the, 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 how, to, how to stand in my truth when I'm talking to someone. I revere my father. I wish everybody had one just like him. Once again, I am looking at this problem in the way that I feel it yeah. actually exists. We can I mean, actually, can we, we, like we can, hold on, hold on. I don't want you to respond I'm to me. I'm holding on. Let me know when oh, I can respond. I, I, I don't want you to respond to me. I want you to respond to You don't to want me to question. respond to what you just now said? Larry. I, I don't get to you, respond to it. I want you to respond to the question that my co-host asked you. I am I am going to respond. Thank you. Don't, don't Thank talk to me. Talk to Rachel. It's Rachel's question. I'm talking to both of you. A young black man, age 10 to 43, is 13 times more likely to be murdered than a young white man, same demo. The number one cause of preventable death for a young white man, 19 years and under, is accidents, like car accidents, or drownings, or drug overdoses. The number one cause for death, preventable death, for a young black man, 19 years and younger, is homicide, almost always at the hands of another 19-year-old black man and under. Blacks account for 60% of the homicides, the shootings, and the robberies in America. Now, I'm sure that neither of you is prepared to say that Black people are just genetically inclined to commit more crime. And if you're not going to say that, and I hope you're not, then if it isn't fatherlessness, if it isn't the absence of a father, marriage to the mother in the home, please tell me what it is that causes these stats. Would you, would you, like, would you like me to answer that question? That I will answer it right answering now. answering the question. I, I'm all, I'm so, 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 so I answer all, that question. So I answer, I'll answer that question. What... To me, what influences any group of people, not black people, not white people, not our Hispanic brothers and sisters, be they Afro-Latino or white identifying Hispanics, what influences crime, destitution, and violence in any community is lack of access to life-affirming structures. Is oh, family a part of that? Okay. okay. Out loud, man. Well, can I finish? You asked me to answer it. Larry, we got to go. Far more Larry, racist. Larry, 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 Larry. We, got to, we got to go. Are you going to answer before we go? Before we go, you don't want to hear that. Before we go, are you going to answer Rachel's question? Are you going to answer Rachel's question? What have you done about fatherlessness? What have you done here? You acknowledge that we have a problem with fatherlessness in the black community. Larry, please answer what have you done to combat fatherlessness? I'm waiting for Rachel to answer my question. Then I'll I've already answered that question. So, so you want me to respond to a problem that you don't think exists? It's okay. Okay. You don't Larry Elder dot com, We really got to go. Larry Elder dot com, We, you have been very generous with your time, Larry. We appreciate you. One thing I will say about Larry Elder, and this interview has been very robust and feelings have been up there. That's how it's supposed to be in America. You should have conversations with people you disagree with. Larry Elder is always here for the argument. He's always here for the fight. 
He believes what he believes and he'll go anywhere and talk about it. There are a lot of people on the right that wouldn't make the time to come in and sit down and have the conversation with us. But Larry Elder did. We do not agree with very much. We might actually think that our various ways of looking at things hurt the other side. But I do appreciate you making the time to talk to us. LarryElder.com. Um, thank you for joining us on Higher Learning. And don't forget my book, As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save a Nation. It's about what happens when you have a one-party state like California where Democrats have dominated the state for decades. People are leaving. Crime is up. Homelessness through the roof. Our, our school test scores are near the bottom. Our budget is a disaster. The average price of a home in California costs 175 percent above the national average, largely because the Democrats are in bed with the environmentalists and they don't want any kind of new construction. So if you want uh, to make sure that what happened to California does not happen to your state, read my book, As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save a Nation. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right, Rach. <clears throat> What'd you learn? I, I'll tell you what I learned and what I wasn't expecting. We, we knew this interview was coming. We had talked about it. We've seen Larry Elder do other interviews. We know his talking points. We know where he stands on certain issues. Wasn't expecting to agree on anything. Wasn't expecting to sway Larry Elder in any way. I knew it would be a back and forth. What I learned and what I wasn't expecting was how much he hates women. Oh. The way you cannot listen to that entire interview and see the way that he responded to you versus the way he would respond to me. I was very respectful. I asked very succinct questions. You did. And the moment I asked a question that he didn't have an answer to, which was very obvious, he was very much so condescending in the way that he handled me to the point where I had to raise my voice, which is not my interview style at all. I leave that to Van. That is not me. <laughs> But it was so disrespectful. And I had an inkling that he was that way just in other interviews. And I've watched the way he treats the with man versus specifically? the women. With women specifically? With women specifically. There just seems to be like a disgust. But he didn't come on that way. But, per, but as we continued the interview, the way he responded to me in the end at the last question, I mean, you even had to direct him. Because he was answering your question. You had to direct him right back to me. Mm. That wasn't expecting. Donnie, your thoughts. It went how I expected. I think. <laughs> I, think I knew, I mean, we all knew about Larry Elder coming into this. Um, and I know how you guys are. You guys are pros. Um, you brought it, you brought it home in a way that I I feel like it it could have gone off the rails. You guys kept it in bounds, kept him uh tried to keep him honest by asking him direct questions that should have had direct answers. And I feel like wrapped it up with a nice bow in the end where we ended up seeing Rachel have to get out of herself in order to get an answer that we still ultimately didn't get. And I feel like Larry Elder didn't come away looking good on this. He definitely, I feel like kind of embarrassed himself in the end when he couldn't answer his uh, plan for his central platform, which is fatherlessness, what he's done to combat that. And I feel like, yeah, it was embarrassing. And you know what, Donnie, too? He's not used to people challenging him with, you know, his gimmick is in this year, this happened. These are the percentages, this, this statistic versus that statistic. And wasn't, I have yet to see really interviews where someone's like, actually, what happened in this year was this. Actually, I'm going to give you this statistic for this. And it was very obvious more than ever that he can only respond to questions in that way. And when you combat it or when you challenge it, he's going to go around about answering the question. He never answered any of your questions directly. He only talked in statistics. Um, so here's the thing. There is a way to have conversations about aspects of black culture and black ascension that uh with people that you disagree with. Now, think about this. In an intergenerational way, we have these conversations all the time. Sure. It starts very young. You know, um, in some way, we always become our parents' generations, uh, 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 which means that we always think that, you know, the younger generation is 50 times more uncouth than we are, we're less talented, uh, 
more savage, more violent. It's always, oh, these kids are they're just like, you've never seen this before, blah, blah, blah. Like, sit down and learn. Um, so having the conversation, you know, I'm 43, Larry's 71, something like that. Having this conversation with an elder, pardon the pun, um, is not something new to me. Um, with people that say, Jesus, family, and education are the answer to your problems. It's not that, not, not that big of a deal. You have those conversations. Yeah. And a lot of times there's something to be learned when you're having them. To me, the meaning of a good faith conversation is the understanding that there are certain things that you believe uh, may not be true and certain things that I believe that may not be true because our perspective colors the way that we look at the world. Now, if you're going to tell me specific facts about Black Americans and their condition in America, and you're going to ignore larger societal condition, conditions that both artificially and actually affect Black people, then it's going to be kind of hard to have an argument in good faith, right? If you talk about uh, Black people's ascension to wealth after the biggest economic boom in the history of the country, and you're not going to talk about the wealth that Black people accru accrued, accrued, shall I say, um, during the time when they went out and and actually bought things and had things and how that was taken from them, not just through violence, but also through usury, through systems, and how those systems endured and how, for example, um, an economic downturn that might be because of the loss of industry, how that affects Black people particularly that have moved from Southern rural areas to urban areas to find jobs that then didn't exist, right? Um, you know, in some cases, black people remigrated back to the South, but in a lot of cases, we was in Chicago, we was in LA, we was in New York, we we're all throughout the Rust Belt. And when the money was gone, systemic problems that had already been there, you could see them a lot easier, right? And that had an effect. Um, when you look at crime and crime in the black community, but you don't look at Situations like there was a fucking 400% rise in crime between the 50s and the 80s. And it had to do with so many different factors that they're just American. Mm -hmm. Just a different. And how really in the 90s, after 92 and 93, crime started trickling off. Mm -hmm. Not tricking off like these niggas, but trickling off. All of these things have to do with the way that you look at this stuff. Because if you want to take a bunch of stats and numbers and make black people look like the worst group of childless, familyless, uh, fucking violent cretins that you want to, to have at it, you could do that. But that doesn't answer any questions. It doesn't answer any questions for black people. It doesn't answer any questions for people in McDowell County, West Virginia the place with the highest number of drug deaths in the entire country, where there's nary a black soul, where coal mining left the place and the people are destitute and they've turned to drugs. If they were over police, perhaps they would have a ridiculous high crime rate because if they're using these drugs and dying from them, mm -hmm. then obviously they're breaking the law. Mm -hmm. okay. So we could talk about all of these things. But at the at 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 the the center of it to me, I don't think I was able to impart this on the Larry, but it's like, what are you trying to get at? Are you trying oh, no, you, to you just you, you got there? Yeah, like what are you like what are you trying to affect? Like what are you trying to talk about? If you're trying to talk about things, you'll look at things in a holistic way. I'll tell you straight up, we need to do better. And the only reason why we need to do better is because these systems that have been put in place to hold us back, they're not going anywhere. So if we're gonna beat them, we have to be a little smarter. We have to have a little bit more solidarity and there might be some areas where we have to do some things that maybe we don't want to do or don't come second nature to us. What I mean about that is terms of reinvesting into things that might take a little bit longer to mature if we want that. Now, if we want to just play the who's the best talented game or who's the most talented game, should I say we want to do all that then have at it. That's the American way. But if we really care about community, then we'll, we'll have a little solidarity there. Um, but my point about the cancer thing was what good does it do us to pretend like these things don't exist? That helps white people feel better, but it doesn't do anything for the people that are working on these problems. Well, he did say racism exists. I yeah, know he, well, I'm, I'm not talking about race. I don't give a fuck what you think about me. I, I, like, I care about whether or not I can't get a home loan. 
So like racism exists and racism is racism. But we should have exists. asked him in what ways because we didn't. I think that was at the end of the interview and I was done. Yeah. But he's like, well, racism, I do believe racism exists. I would have loved to know in what way. Yeah, he's kicking his ass right there. That's what. Um, <laughs> they, they don't but, 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 but look, what I would say to people that are frustrated by all of this, look, it's, it's just, I, this is how it is. This is how it goes. I got to talk about it. I hope that you guys got something. Maybe you got nothing. But it's not the last one. I'm sure they were entertained. I will tell you this. I don't know if we need to interview RFK Jr. We're going to do that interview. I don't think we need to do them. Do him though. I'm good with not doing Yeah, that. you never want to. <laughs> but I'm I'll, good on that. I'll tell you why I don't think we need to interview RFK Jr. now is because he's no longer really a factor. Yeah. Um, in the race at the time that we were talking about it. Technically. He was, he was, well, he, well, I'm saying he was polling at like 20%. He was making like a mm -hmm. lot of noise. I think the more people that have gotten a whiff of his politics, the more people have actually been turned off by him. And if he's irrelevant to uh, what's happening over there, it makes no sense to bring him on. Um, and that's not a diss to, to RFK. It's just like, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like a, it's whatever. Now, if he decides to go third party, that would be a huge story. Um, and then we'd probably have something to talk to him about. But sure. we're not putting on pe people on here just to talk to them. This was, a, I think, a pertinent conversation that exists. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, look, um, guys, God damn it, catch your breath. Take your thing caps off, but do not stop learning. I'm Van Lathan Jr. And I'm Rachel Lynn Lindsay. Bye, guys. We're just talking loud and saying no.